My name is Heather Marsh. I am an author and I write a great deal about mass collaboration and horizontal governance and I've worked for many years as an activist and journalist to amplify voices in urgent need of attention, primarily whistleblowers. I am also a software developer and I'm working on a project called GetG which is a universal database commons that will help us share, audit and amplify open collaborative information so that we can participate intelligently in our own governance. My focus has always been human rights and horizontal governance. Of the human rights atrocities I've worked to expose, a very large number are associated with David Shedd and the organizations and allies he represents. As just one example, I fought for over a decade to achieve justice for my fellow Canadian Omar Cotter, who was abducted at 15 years old, subjected to the most horrific torture at the CIA black site Bagram, then trafficked and tortured for another decade at Guantanamo before enduring a show trial of invented court, invented evidence, invented experts, and retroactively applied invented crimes. The hell this Canadian child went through for 12 years was conducted by the organizations represented by David Shedd. It's deeply uncomfortable for me to be here today on the same panel as someone whose work has established and worked to normalize ever-increasing drone murders, black site disappearances, and torture. And I hope it is uncomfortable for all of you as well, and for him. Beware of your contribution to the growing banality of evil, lest you yourselves become a cog in the machinery of terror. I am here today because I want to talk about how our structures of power are evolving. There is probably only one thing I have in common with David Shedd, and that is that we both want a world without whistleblowers. He wants to crush whistleblowers, and I want a world where the caregivers of our communities and land hold institutional power, where everyone's voice is heard, and those who terrorize us with impunity lose the power to do so. If there is one thing I would like people to take home today or start thinking about after today, it's the definition of a whistleblower. There seems to have been an effort lately to equate whistleblowers solely with an elite Western, usually male, leaking documents. A few days ago I read an article about a program for whistleblowers within the US intelligence agencies. It was a human resources program for employee grievances. The people they were calling whistleblowers were torturers at Bagram who didn't like having a female boss or assassins who felt overlooked for promotion. And then there was a cover full of whistleblowers on Time magazine this year, but they were called silence breakers. What is a silence breaker if not a whistleblower? You know, there are no female philosophers because a female philosopher is called a feminist. Apparently we have the same sort of thing happening here. There are no whistleblowers outside of this elite demographic because they're called activists or silence breakers or something. I've worked with many whistleblowers over many years. I worked with Rohingya activists from 2012 on to help convince the world that they were in fact experiencing a genocide. I've worked with victims of trafficking networks and resource corporations and institutions like prisons and care facilities. Whistleblowers are people like the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina who fought the silence of the dictatorship in defense of the disappeared and all the movements like them that have followed in their steps, like Central America's Caravan of Missing Migrants, or Nigeria's Bring Back Our Girls movement, or the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women in movement in Canada, or the Missing Students Activists in Mexico, or the people standing up against ICE programs in the United States right now. They include labor activists like Kim Jin Suk, a woman who in 2011 stayed up a crane for 309 days to protest the lack of labor rights in South Korea, and Hua Hafeng, who was arrested in China recently for exposing abuses against workers in the factories manufacturing Ivanka Trump's brand. They include Maria del Rosario Fuentes Rubio, who was murdered for her reporting on Mexican cartels in 2014, and Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was killed by a car bomb in Malta last October for her work exposing organized crime. They include the environment caregivers now being killed at a recorded rate of four a week and increasing. They include Elena Maleno, who has been credited with saving the lives of at least 10,000 refugees in the Strait of Gibraltar and is now facing imprisonment in Morocco. And they include your own MP, Joe Cox, who was murdered because of her work in caring for refugees. Obviously, we could do this for days. Whistleblowers come from absolutely every demographic, but there is one group that is vastly overrepresented, and that is the caregivers of our communities and land standing against the impunity enjoyed by powerful criminals. The media coverage depicting whistleblowers as a fairly elite demographic of Western male hackers leaking documents is a little disproportionate. But those in power do understand where the threat to their impunity is coming from. China arrested five women in 2015 just for distributing pamphlets against sexual harassment. Canada openly 
identifies First Nations communities and environmentalists as target groups to be monitored for terrorist activity, and it's obvious in the terrorist definitions of every country. The definition of terrorism in every one of the Five Eyes states is attempting to influence your community or government, which is also the definition of democracy. Participating in your own governance, alerting your neighbors to what is happening, is defined as terrorism. So this redefinition of whistleblowers as scary non-state actors and hostile intelligence services, this will be used against the women and men who are the community and land caregivers of every nation because these are the number one threat to the carpet mafia that wants immunity from prosecution for their crimes. As soon as laws against whistleblowers are passed, they will be used against people accusing MPs of rape or people letting the public know that Trudeau has just turned more lakes into toxic waste dumps for mines or people boycotting Israel or the NRA. It is this groundswell of community and land caregivers, the rising up of 7.5 billion people participating in their own governance, that is the real threat to corrupt power. So we need to define whistleblowers properly or we're not going to come up with solutions that will actually meet their needs. A human resources program in the CIA will not help all these people. Even in the case of John Caracu, obviously he should never have been imprisoned for pointing out that there was torture at Guantanamo, but everyone in Guantanamo would have and did try to tell us the same thing. It is the people in Guantanamo and every other prison who we never should have allowed to be silenced in the first place, and these are the voices we need to make sure we hear. I remembered what I don't like about the media coverage of whistleblowers. I feel like it is covered in such a personality-centered, celebrity-focused way that it's like listening to people discussing Harry Styles' hair. There are important issues to be discussed in the structure of power that allows only some people's voices to be heard. How can we directly hear from voices which are being silenced? This is something I've been working on for years because it turns out you can murder millions of people without leaving a paper trail or inspiring an insider whistleblower. So how do we make sure we hear all voices? If mining corporations and the Asuni say indigenous people are just killing each other and it has nothing to do with them, who outside can prove that one way or another? With the Rohingya genocide, ironically, the best documentation we could get was from Google Maps, which showed villages that had been there earlier and now they were gone. I thought a lot about different solutions for years, like uploading testimony in actionable affidavit format from places like Myanmar or UN peacekeeping camps or anywhere people are silenced and at risk. If you look at the current Oxfam story, that was absolutely no surprise to anyone who works in human rights, and it's certainly not just Oxfam either. You will find this everywhere. You have the same structure of power and secrecy at the top and fear and silencing at the bottom. We've seen it in NGOs, militaries, UN peacekeepers over and over. That's why I'm working on a universal database to try to democratize this access to a megaphone and bring us information from everyone. It's not new laws we need. We already have so many international laws protecting our human rights, our rights to freedom of expression, our right to knowledge, our rights to not be tortured and murdered, our right to a fair trial, and those are all being ignored. We don't need to create another witness protection program with the mafia in charge of it. It's our governance that we need that needs to be revamped. We're still governed by a form of democracy created before women or children or indigenous people or laborers were considered persons or part of the demos and before any international networks existed below the level of trade empires. It's been almost 400 years since that awful Cambridge man argued in Patriarcha that an all-powerful patriarchal system was the only legitimate form of governance. And Robert Filmer was most decisively rebutted by Oxford's own John Locke, who ought to be familiar to anyone from the United States as well because he was fairly influential in creating the ideology they're supposed to be run by. I did think that Western democracies were done with this debate, if you want to live under an all-powerful patriarchal form of governance, you move to an absolute monarchy or a dictatorship, not a democracy. Patriarchy and democracy are incompatible. We settled this nearly 400 years ago. And it's customary for those who uphold this absolute form of secretive, tyrannical rule to call people like me anarchists. But if all anarchy means is there is, are no absolute rulers or centralized authority, then shouldn't that be a basic tenet of democracy? If you do want democracy, it's not just media that needs to be free, and it's not even just speech. It's knowledge. An uninformed vote is a coerced vote. People without reliable information they can trust will follow ideologies and demagogues blindly, as we're seeing more and more lately, as our access to information and our trust in information is eroded. 
And when government is conducted in secrecy, the atrocities that have repeated throughout history will happen again, as they always do in the dark. We don't, we really don't need to keep proving this. So we don't need reactionaries trying to shore up some ancient flailing patriarchy with ever-increasing tyranny and secrecy. And we don't need revolutionaries knocking off figureheads and installing their own messiahs onto the same structure. We need to build a democracy that is right for today, that includes everyone and resists tyranny. And that means democratic access to knowledge and participatory governance. Well, yes, because the majority of the whistleblowers I deal with don't have proper channels and they aren't given any choice over the situation they're in. That is the whole point. They don't have institutional power. And we need institutional power for community and land caregivers and an end to the secrecy and impunity at the top. Because we're told we need these structures of absolute power and secrecy for our safety. But intelligence agencies are not competent to protect you from ISIS or anyone else. The heads of most of the top intelligence agencies in the United States were compromised recently by a 15-year-old British boy called Crackers with Attitude, and he wasn't hacking, he just guessed his way in. An Australian student just noticed the U.S. military was revealing all their military locations in Syria through the Fitbit app. Australian MPs just sold a load of top-secret documents in an old filing cabinet. There are homemade drones taking out military planes that cost more than your health care. They are not competent to keep you safe. But even if they were competent, our safety is not their priority. I remember in one of the mass shootings in the United States, this one involved really tiny kids. And there were two things that really stood out for me about this case. One, the mother was completely blamed for her son's actions, even though she was his first victim. President Obama and the media both left her name off the victim list as if she was a perpetrator or a non-human. The other thing that struck me was that she was entirely blamed but she had no community support she could have relied on. This was a single woman living with an obviously violent and very disturbed adult son, and she had absolutely nowhere to turn for help. How is she supposed to be responsible for something she has no power to stop? And we've just seen the exact same thing happen again in Florida. The students and teachers and community were blamed for not doing enough, but they did everything in their power, and they were ignored because the politicians are not listening to them. Look at the army with hashtag on social media this week. Teachers are asking for books, time, resources, mental health care, a decent adult-to-child ratio. They're saying they don't need guns. They need resources to build community. And the U.S. government is offering guns because that is profit for the only nation they care about, which is the weapons manufacturers and the NRA. Some people have been really worried in past years about terrorists entering into Europe with refugees. And yes, of course they have. Not nearly as many as some people would like you to believe because we all have our own homegrown terrorists now. But yes, some have gone through camps, and the people in the refugee camps will tell you who those people are. Or online communities will tell you. In Canada, we had a man a couple of years ago who he used to torture kittens to death and upload the videos online. He was reported by most people who saw the videos, and they were ignored. Then he went on a gore site. And you would think if we have some all-powerful patriarchal power trying to keep us all safe, they must be monitoring gore sites, right? And he advertised an upcoming murder. And he was reported and the reports were ignored. Then he horrifically murdered somebody and uploaded that video. He was reported by so many people. One retired police officer in the United States reported him to the RCMP, the FBI, and his local sheriff. Everyone ignored all the reports. He took the body out of his own apartment, passed the CCTV cameras in his street and his, his building, and put it in a dumpster. Then he took his biometric smart Canadian passport under his own name, which was all over the international news and on an Interpol warrant, and he boarded an international flight from Canada to France and then to Germany, where he sat in a cyber cafe reading articles about himself until finally a man in the cafe went out and got a police officer to come in and arrest him. Is this blinding incompetence or is our safety maybe not really a great concern for the intelligence agencies? And the answer, of course, is both. They're not competent to keep you safe, but also they aren't listening. The mothers, the caregivers, the schools, the people online, the people in refugee camps, these people are all ignored. They're listening to corporations like Arava or Shell. Boko Haram took root initially in an area completely overwhelmed by the corruption of Goodluck Jonathan's government and the devastation brought by Shell and other oil companies. Areas like Mali and Niger were equally devastated by France's Arava Corporation, among others. 
The people living on that land were being murdered and left with no means of survival by criminal corporations and complicit government. Again, the lack of power and the extreme abuse of community and land caregivers creates vulnerability to the growth of terrorism. And it is no secret to the intelligence communities that this is the trigger. The minute you hear protests start against Ereva, you also start hearing France and the United States talking about growing into extremist threat because they know very well that extremism follows backing people into a corner with no way to turn. So again, the solution is to empower the caregivers, listen to them, and end impunity for criminal corporations. If you know corporate policies are going to cause the growth of ideological extremism, maybe change corporate policies before that happens. Protection available only to the highest bidders is not security. Security is strong, involved, and supportive communities network with other communities. I think if we're going to talk about national security on this panel, we need some context. David Shedd belonged to the most powerful, well-funded, weaponized, international, organized crime syndicate the world has ever seen. Not even counting the other organizations he's affiliated with or those he calls his allies, just looking at the CIA by itself. They're in the business of assassinations. They manage black sites for torture. They work with local mafias, cartels, and militias all over the world. They run operations trafficking weapons, drugs, and people all over the world. They have ongoing programs of human experimentation. These are just a few of the things that the CIA itself has done, not counting their network of allies. They are part of a vast criminal network that is now planning even greater expansion, more torture, far more disappearances, far more murder. So when these men talk about whistleblowers threatening national security, we need to ask three obvious questions. What is security to them? Who is their nation? And who are the whistleblowers? So given that we're dealing with criminals and members of criminal organizations, what they mean by security is immunity from criminal prosecution. And we've seen that. They do not keep us safe. We have plenty of evidence of that, but they certainly do keep themselves safe. The U.S. military bombed an MSF hospital. Can we investigate? No, we cannot. They bulldozed the evidence. They tortured some folks. They plan on torturing a lot more, according to the current CIA head, but that's classified. Jeffrey Epstein is a man in the United States known to have raped and trafficked dozens or hundreds or who knows how many children. The U.S. Attorney General at that time, Alberto Gonzalez, said he would have instructed the U.S. Justice Department to pursue justice without making a political mess. Epstein's Little Black Book contains people like Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew. There's only one way to interpret that directive, and that is impunity for anyone above a certain social strata or anyone who has blackmail on them. The Pentagon, since 2010, has refused to investigate at that time, it was over 1,700 cases of child abuse media they found on Pentagon computers. The people in the United States are finally starting to talk about all the taxpayer-funded NDAs that protect people in Congress against reports of rape and sexual assault. California alone has reportedly paid more than $25 million in the last three years to buy criminal impunity for their politicians. In the UK, you have your own child rape inquiry where UK police have spoken many times of investigations which have a strata they can't go above, where those above that strata are referred to as the untouchables, protected by the Official Secrets Act and many other layers of secrecy. Your former Oxford Union president and UK Prime Minister, Ted Heath, how many people came forward and said they were his victims as children, but there was never an investigation during his lifetime? So security for them means immunity from criminal prosecution not just for their actions against so-called enemies, but against anyone. The current CIA head talks about a bureaucracy that slows down the CIA. That bureaucracy is our human rights, and that is how they see our lives, as bureaucracy. If they kill too many of us at once, they have to fill out a form, and that slows them down. Pompeo wants agile assassins. He wants killers who fail fast and break things as if they were writing stupid apps instead of murdering children. He wants disruptive terrorism. And their security is the freedom to do this with impunity and in secrecy. And who is this nation they want security for? The United States were supposedly enemies with Syria and allies with Canada when they were abducting Canadians to be tortured in Assad's prisons. Their allegiances change at the drop of a hat, and they all have each other's secrets anyway. That is the entire point of their industry. The 
entire supranational intelligence community has access to each other's secrets. They need security from the rest of us finding out. And their nation is anyone with enough money to pay them, corporations or states. You had Eric Prince speaking here a while back, the crown prince of mercenary contractors. He made his fortune at the top ranks of U.S. military and intelligence and then contracted all that information to supposedly U.S. enemy China. I believe David Chet is also now an in international private practice. Their nations are whoever can pay. We didn't really need the U.S. Patriot Act to tell us our intelligence agencies may be allies, but the people in our states are certainly not their allies. This is not national security. It's certainly not security for my nation. My nation consists of the caregivers of communities and the environment all over the world. They aren't spying on corporations and telling communities what corporations are up to. They're spying on communities and selling that information to corporations. The victims of Jeffrey Epstein, all the victims whose abusers are protected by official secrets and taxpayer-funded NDAs, none of these victims are part of their nation. Their nation is the international intelligence community and the politicians and corporations who can afford to pay them. This is not national security. It's a mafia protection racket available to the highest bidder. Why are you not doing anything about ICE internment camps in the United States if you care so much for Latin Americans? Maybe you should read the news. Torturers. Have you not read the torture report? Obama declassified part of it, didn't you know? Torturing people. I asked you for 12 years to stop torturing my friend and you didn't stop. 